Hello, everyone, and welcome to week six of Advanced Exercise Physiology with Concordia University in Irvine. Once again, I'm Professor Mark Baines, and we're going to talk mostly about acid-base balance and temperature regulation when it comes to exercise. Uh, a few things, first off, right off the bat, with a few things from the last week and uh, in previous weeks, uh, talking about important variables that really occur every single week, but things that we should now have at least reasonable clarity on and things that need to be clarified in your discussion board posts, things you should be mentioning every time so we're not unclear about when you say any given, talk about any given drill or exercise you're doing, that we're, we're clear about the work period, we're clear about the rest periods, uh, when you're talking about repeat anything, uh, and intensity specifically as it relates to, when you say intensity, high intensity, are you referring to heart rate? Are you referring to RPE? Are you referring to percent force output? Or also what's not on here, percent VO2 max. And VO2 max and heart rate aren't exactly the same. RP is not the same as heart rate or VO2 max necessarily. And force out is not the same as necessarily the other factors. They all are independent factors. They may not all be the same. And ideally, we'll have certain aspects of each of these. And in some cases, we'll have the not so ideal. We wanna make sure you understand that too. That will come back to that in a moment. Uh, work periods. Whenever you talk about uh, something explosive or powerful, you better be talking about something that's 10 seconds or less. Nothing wrong with going for 12 seconds or 15 seconds or 20, 30, 40, 60 seconds or longer with the goal of being as powerful as possible or being as fast as possible. But if you say things like speed or sprint, or explosive all-out effort, then you better be looking at something that's 10 seconds or less if you're really expecting to get 95 to 100% AT, uh, output, because ATP only lasts two to five seconds, somewhere in there. Creatine phosphate is only absolutely uh, the primary uh, energy system after ATP up till eight to 10 seconds. Some would argue it could be longer, and it can be, but certainly that's the most agreed upon number is somewhere in that 10 second range for creatine phosphate, which is why the highest of intensities 95 to 100%, some would argue 90 95%, up to 100%, um, or the first 10 seconds. Anything you go 10 seconds to about 180 seconds, somewhere in there. Now you're talking about intensities that are about 70 to 90%, give or take. It's a little bit of variance here and there, a few percentage points, of course, depends on pe different athletes, different people. That's what we're talking about. So work periods that are 10 to 180 seconds, you're talking about intensity output, force output wise, we're talking about 70 to 90%. Okay, you're not going to get 95% um, output for three minutes. You're probably going to even get 90% for three minutes. You're going to get the 90% close to that 10 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe close to a little more than that for 90% plus effort. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to get closer and closer to the 70% the longer you go, no matter how hard you try. This is the part where people are very confused, I think, in some of your discussion board posts. I keep harping on you, and I'm going to keep doing it, not because I want to give you a hard time, not because I'm trying to make it hard on you in general, because I want you to get the concepts, because you want to go out there and take care of your athletes, get them the best possible training, with the best understanding you have, can possibly have of physiology, so you can give them the best performance efforts uh, down the road, or give them the best opportunity for those efforts. Okay? So your absolute all effort, you might be going as fast as you possibly can. To clarify this once again, uh, you might be saying your effort is 9 or a 10, but if you're going for several minutes, your output's going to be maximal 70%, maybe less, Okay, no matter what you do. And that said, uh, that work period uh, is going to be indicative of how, how high intensity you can be at the maximum. Uh, and rest period, of course, you need to have proper rest. If you have 10 second or less output, rest periods are going to be 90 seconds or more, at least, okay, to get 90 plus percent ATP recovery so you can actually give the output for type 2X and type 2A muscle fibers in particular to do the work in that short burst work. And the work periods that tend the high variability from 10 seconds up to about two or three minutes. Now we're talking about mostly type 2A with some involvement of type 1 and type 2X, of course. Certainly, uh, but that said, the closer you get to three minutes, you're going to get more and more type one muscle fibers. The red, red, slow twitch, hemoglobin rich, uh, red blood cell rich uh, muscle fibers. Okay, and we're going to need rest periods at least in the 30 to 90 second range, minimally. Okay, between sets, or any of those work periods we're talking about, and then we start going to two, three minutes or beyond, somewhere in that range, the effort level being 70, 75 percent or less. Okay, you can argue in some cases some of them may not need rest for hours, all depending on who we're talking about. Okay. Uh, and that said, intensity, again, be very clear when you say high intensity. High effort is not high performance output, and that is the goal. I know it's your goal. I know it's the goal of every one of your athletes. So you better make sure that you're clear when you say that. They're giving all out effort. Uh, what are you talking about? That's RPE. They may not necessarily give you all out performance. It's very frustrating for all of us when we're giving the best effort we can and our performance isn't there. Well, our RPE is a 9 or a 10, but our actual output's maybe a 7 or 8 or less. 
happens all the time, in which case what's, what you're being told, what the athlete's essentially telling you by their performance, is you need to cool off on the idea of having that high-intensity day today. It's not going to happen. It's not there. Or maybe you just did too many sets, but something's not right. If they're giving you the top effort, but they're not giving you top performance, it's not going to happen today. Unless you think it's something to do with not enough warm-up, uh, you might give a little bit longer rest for next set and see how they do the next set. I'd try that once or twice. Generally speaking, I think that's fair to do. See if maybe it's just an anomaly and we need to give them a little bit better warm-up period or maybe a little more rest between sets to kind of see how we do here. But if we're doing that on a regular basis, there's something wrong in the programming in general, not just the athlete having a bad day. Okay, um, Heart rate-wise, the goal is not to get that heart rate up. Uh, we talk about cardiac output. Uh, cardiac output has two components, heart rate and stroke volume. When you have two athletes, both engaging in moderate intensity activity, and it starts getting more and more intense, one athlete has the heart rate rising up significantly, the other one does not. Well, clearly one has a higher VO2 max, uh, and maybe also a potentially a lactate threshold performance level is better for that particular person. But that said, what's undoubtedly happening is stroke volume is sufficient in the higher uh, more cardiac efficient athlete, the one who's got the lower heart rate at this intensity at this moment, has a higher stroke volume, so the heart rate does not need to go up. The only reason, the only reason the heart rate goes up significantly in one person versus another is one person has the stroke volume that is sufficient, the other one is not. So if the goal is to get the heart rate up, you're saying, I'm trying to make you as inefficient as possible. We all know the heart rate's going to go up. It's going to go up with higher intensities, uh, any regular high intensity activity is going to see a raise in heart rate. That should never be the goal. Uh, I gave you a few of your hard time with uh, saying, what about scaring you? What about watching a scary movie or getting you nervous? That's going to get your heart rate up. And of course, I'm sure it aggravated you. The goal is not to aggravate you. The goal is to remind you that just getting the heart rate up is never the goal. Let's even get the heart to pump at a higher rate. No, let's make sure we get the heart to get the right nutrients, the right oxygen to the right tissues in the most efficient way possible. Perfect world, we have a high force output. We have a low RPE and a low heart rate. That's the perfect world, okay? Uh, but the cardiac output ideally would be a low heart rate with a high stroke volume, high ejection of blood from the ventricles of the heart with very low heartbeat. That would be the perfect world, and the most efficient athletes have it on a good day. Heart variability differences. Um, high heart rate variability would exist in the athlete who's very well conditioned while at rest. They're resting there, but the moment there something happens, like uh, the phone rings, they have to jump up and go get it, or uh, basically they have to respond to some external stress or internal stress very quickly, the heart will change the time in between beats, but then it'll return back to normal again. My favorite analogy, and I'm pretty sure I used it in a previous video before, is once again the high-end uh, restaurant. All the waiters are waiting for something to happen. They go take care of it. They, they basically polish off your silverware. They give you a new plate. They fold your napkin. They push in your chair. They dust off the table. And they go right back to being on the side again, ready to go again. So they go into, into a quick mode, high variability. And they go right back down to nothing where it's very, or not, I'm not sorry, high variability. Quick heart rate, so to speak, for a brief moment. And that drops significantly and they're back to normal again. Whereas an inefficient person's like in that diner, those waiters and waitresses or the bus people who are not really very efficient at their jobs, they don't really change a lot, they don't move different speeds, and things don't get done as well. They don't really ever see a dramatic change at rest from the variability standpoint. But the moment you get both these two engaged in activity, well, the more efficient one's going to have low variability at exertion, and the less efficient one is going to have high variability balancing all over the place with heart rate-wise, having a hard time adapting to stress during exertion, okay? Um, from a very general standpoint, you could do it on a treadmill with someone uh, who doesn't have a heart rate monitor. If they're either deconditioned or out of shape, uh, if you get them on a treadmill at a fairly moderate activity, somewhere in the 140 beat range, maybe something like that, you can see at the same level steady state, performance-wise, maybe they're six miles per hour, maybe they're seven miles per hour, depends on the person, right? Maybe they're five miles per hour. Uh, you're gonna see their heart rate jumping around on the monitor. It's going to go 143, 142, 141, 138, 146, 147, jumping around. Whereas the fit person, it'll be a 140, 140, 140, 140, 140, 141, 140. Just stays the same. Very, very consistent. There's less variability. There's not much change in there from one beat to the next. So you're not going to see a average, which is what your heart monitor is giving you is an average, what that's going to be for what it's reading right now. Okay? That's what it's basically telling you. That's why you won't see much change. Okay? So that's our goal. Lower heart rates and lower variability at exertion, uh, ideally. Now, the ideal, of course, is that you return back to homeostasis. You're trying to get that body to return back to a reasonable hormonal level, trying to get the heart rate to return back to a low enough level aerobically below 
um, that 40% VO2 max, or right around that 40% VO2 max, the very, very most, 50% VO2 max, very, very most, we should say, which means your heart rate's got to be below 60, 65% at least of your max heart rate when you take the old school formula, 220 minus your age, multiplied by that 60, 65%, okay? That's what we're talking about. Got to get at least below that. Perfect world, even more than that. Right? I want you to feel good by the end of that cool down and feel like you actually are ready to be recovered so that you go on with your day and come back again later today and exert again or come back tomorrow with a reasonable level of effort uh, knowing that you've done a good job with the cool down to help your body be more efficient returning to homeostasis as quickly as possible. We want our athletes to get as close as we can to rest before they actually are resting. Okay, uh, perfect world that cool down will probably last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes in most cases, but sometimes it'd be longer if it's very cold out, the person's very deconditioned um, uh, in a very hot environment uh, with a well-conditioned athlete, it may only be 5 10 minutes, could be much shorter than that. But heart rate's got to come down because we need to be aerobic level exertion, need to be recovery level, and remember it was in one of your former chapters, um, a couple chapters back, and I actually mentioned it in the video, and it was also on your test, What's that ideal uh, heart rate or VO2 max or heart rate range whereby you are going to at the highest level of recovery, whereby cortisol levels actually decrease during activity below below rest levels, and you get natural killer cell activity for the immune system to actually respond at a higher level, effectively strengthening the immune system is 40 to 50 percent VO2 max, which equates to no more than about 60, technically about 63 percent max heart rate. That's where you want to be for that cool down or by the end of the cool down and where you want to be on a, cool, on a uh, light day, okay? Uh, now, with that said, to actually get the, the relationship between VO2 max, max heart rate, uh, RPE, remember, is all about perception. So it's what the person says. I feel like I'm pushing this hard, and you got to take them at their word because you can't really tell. You can look at facial expressions. They'll give you some feedback about what, you're, what you really think is going on and what you can estimate to be going on. But ultimately, they're the ones that tell you that. Actual force output is what we want. We're the coaches. We want you to be running this 100-meter dash in this speed. We want you to get up and down the field in this amount of time. We want you to be able to get the ball into the goal, get the ball into the basket, get the ball into the end zone, uh, swim and touch the end line, whatever it is, by a certain time point. They want a certain force output, certain speed or level of strength to get you there by that time. Okay. Well, their RPE will vary based on what they tell you they're doing. You give them an absolute what they need to have for force output. Okay. Max heart rate, well, the best athlete more than likely is if you want the lower heart rate, not the highest one. I will tell you this, unquestionably, you're not going to see the person with the highest heart rate consistently be the one who finishes first, unless everybody else just doesn't care and they're apathetic. Okay? If they're all working as hard as they can, you're not going to see the highest conditioned athlete with the highest heart rate. You're not going to see that. You see them with the lower heart rates if you had to monitor everybody. And by the way, you can do that in the pool or on land. Okay? And of course, VO2 max, we're just talking about your pace of what you would do for about 10 to 12 minutes at your fastest possible pace. In 10 to 12 minutes, that is your pace we're talking about. So clearly a sprint, technically, from a standpoint of effort, is going to be above VO2 max, right? Your interval work is going to be above more than 100% VO2 max. 120, 130, 150, 160. You'd have to break down exactly what someone can do in 10 to 12 minutes for an athlete for uh, their VO2 max test. And then speed-wise, expect well, for 60 seconds, I expect you to be a whole lot faster than what you'd be going for 10 to 12 minutes. Or maybe that was your goal, just to keep average that same speed that would normally be your race pace at 10, 12 minutes and make you do that for 60 seconds with 45 seconds rest or 60 seconds rest. Do it again and again and again and again, 10 times or something like that, or four times, six times, okay? But that, that uh, calculator here is what I would absolutely use as your quick reference to remind yourself the difference between heart rate and VO2 max. And I will keep, now as we get farther along, every time you say intensity, I'm going to go, what's the max heart rate? What's the VO2 max? What's the RP? What's the force output? Every time you should be saying RPE and force output. VO2 max at sprint level, it's not really reasonable to be talking about that. Endurance athletes or endurance uh, uh, events or glycolytic type levels type stuff, we want to see more what VO2 max effort would be. But for sprints, it's going to be well above VO2 max. Not worried about that. Max heart rate, still want you to understand what that's going to look like. Okay. Yeah, sprinters are going to get their heart rate up pretty, pretty high up there at the end of a, a high level sprint. On a good day, though, it'll be lower than it would be uh, versus a bad day. Now, uh, right intensity versus high, moderate, lower intensity, that is the goal, isn't it? It's not about the high intensity is the best or low intensity is the best or moderate intensity. It's what makes the most sense today. How do we know? How they do yesterday or the day before? Then we base on that on the fact that we want to have them recover. So do we need a recovery day? 
to make sure they can actually do this again a day or two after that? Or are we going to go hard again today? But if we're going hard again today, we went hard yesterday, what are the chances they actually perform at the same level again? Or, more importantly, are we going to push them so hard they're going to perform poorly in days three and four and five? You have to take all those things into account, right? We've all had the coaches who think that somehow every practice is supposed to be all out all the time. Those teams don't often do well by the end of the season compared to their their uh, peers because they get pushed too hard for too long. If the season is long, they won't. Maybe in two or three months, they might be okay. If we're talking about four, six, eight, 10, 12 months of conditioning, the team that's actually slowly built them up and not pushed them to the nth degree is going to one that be the one that has the greatest level of conditioning near the end of a game or a match, okay, or an event. Uh, but the right intensity is what we want, not high, moderate, or low is the ideal. Low intensity, force output, remember again, 70%-ish or less. Moderate, somewhere in that 70 85%, okay, somewhere in there, give or take. And high intensity is at 90 to 100% intensity. And if we're talking about work periods, 90 to 100% intensity, you're not going to get more than certainly 10 seconds or, or less for 95%. 90%, some would argue, you can get close to 20, 30 seconds or more uh, from that same template of 90% intensity. Now, that's probably questionable for 90%, but certainly 85% maybe for a lot of athletes of max force output. Okay, and it's not hard to figure out. You watch someone run as fast as they can. Take Usain Bolt, who runs that 958, did run that 958 100 meter dash. Uh, running a 400, he's not going to run a 400 in 42. He's not going to do that. Okay, he's going to be running or, or below 40, nothing like that. It's going to be several seconds more than that. He's going to lose a percent, a few percentage points in force output by going for that long. Okay, conditioning being playing a role and just genetic, just simply. Uh, capacity for work beyond a certain point. That's why uh, you can't expect that uh, same old performance no matter how long for how long you go out. It has to be very much dependent upon the expect the time frame versus how fast a person can bring back ATP to replenish those cells to perform the work again. Right? Uh, acid base balance. Well, uh, your pH, generally speaking, is somewhere around 7.4, and as you engage in more exertion or just more stress in general, blood levels of acidosis are going to go uh, go to higher levels of acidosis. pH will go down, okay, closing towards 7, and hopefully never below 7. You're not going to survive very long, if at all, to go below 7, but it's going to go down, okay? Uh, and what you're talking about, when we talk about exertion or stress in general, and the blood, uh, as far as uh, blood rushing to the areas where the stress is needed, right? Stresses need to be dealt with, right? Blood rushing to get oxygen and nutrients to those areas, right? We're talking about muscles, all right? Muscles are exerting at higher and higher levels, building up an intensity. We're going for longer duration, which of course adds intensity, let alone time, right? Hydrogen ion accumulation from the byproduct of the uh, utilization of energy and breakdown of ATP to be used for usable energy. And of course, the uh, breaking apart of that of the, that ion or that bond uh, will create those excess hydrogen ions, right? And so that consequently, the body has to replenish ATP and remove all the excess hydrogen ions at the same time. And what you're really typically getting when we talk about someone feeling like burning sensation is the competing aspects of what's going on internally, trying to get replenish of ATP as well as remove excess waste hydrogen ions at the same time. The body says, we can't do this all at once. You got to take a break. Of course, we say, go another rep. No, don't. Your next rep will be less force output no matter what you do, guaranteed. It cannot be the same level of force output. So you got to be clear what your goal is at that moment in time when you make that statement to keep going for another rep or two. That sounds more like psychological purpose, which so be it. Physiologically, you're getting worse, and there's nothing that you can do about that. Okay? In talking about acid-base uh, balance as it relates to acidosis potential effects, well, certainly that buildup of... Uh, hydrogen ions, and that's certainly that acidic level in the blood is going to keep you from performing work. Long term, if you don't remove uh, the waste products in that area, people get thought of that bloated feeling after doing a hypertrophy type workout or high level interval type workouts or blood's pulling in the legs and whatnot. Uh, that's not a good thing. You don't want to walk away from your training session feeling that way. You should not feel that, at least to any significant extent. When you walk away, you should feel loose again. You should feel relaxed again. You should feel like at least you're not having all the blood bloating in that, those particular areas. You're not feeling all, all, all bloated at the end of the time you're walking away from the gym or walking off the track or getting out of the pool and not. You want to make sure that cool down process has accumulated to a certain level that at least 10, 15 minutes, maybe longer, such that we can actually remove the, acid, the effects of acidosis so we don't have those long-term ill effects, which will be lead to long-term lesser performance. Uh, certainly fatigue in the short term, but of course that fatigue in the short term, if it's repeated often enough, 
are pushed, we are pushed too long, too hard, without the ability to remove the acidosis. And I don't, I don't I'm talking about how what you eat after and all that, which is all good stuff. Just what you can do as a coach, make sure that, that proper cool down, make sure that not alone they have red, alone they have light, right, right rest between sets and the proper cool down so you can help remove that acidosis. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at long-term fatigue, uh, chronic fatigue, and of course, chronic tuck-related injuries. When people keep getting injuries over and over and over again, yeah, a lot of that may be due to do with lack of strength and whatnot, absolutely true, but it also may just be pushing too hard and conditioning. That also could play a big role as well. Uh, it could be poor conditioning. you got to know your athlete, right? Uh, as far as buffers you can possibly take in, well, first of all, type 2X muscles, muscle fibers uh, will have a higher buffering capacity. They have to. They're going to be going all out exertion, 90, 95, 100% type output, 10 seconds or less on average, generally speaking. We're talking about you've got to have the high buffering capacity to really give you that kind of level of force output, okay? That said, uh, it doesn't mean that somehow... Uh, a lot of people say because they say type 2X muscle fibers have a higher buffering capacity doesn't mean that they're actually going to go for longer. It just means that they have to have that higher buffering capacity to be able to give you the level of force production you need for that explosive effort, for the high level of speed, and to be able to give it to you in such a short period of time before the ATP and the creatine phosphate runs out. Okay. That said, the things you can do, you can take in more water will help getting hydration to the area, will help reduce some of that acidosis, some of reduce some of that buffer, uh, some help buffer some of those acids, right? Eating the proper diet as a whole, particularly the carbohydrate, plays a big, big role with that. Uh, protein's not going to help you with energy balance. It's not going to help you with that. It's going to help you more toward getting uh, your amino acid, amino acid balance to get you back to help build and repair cells post-workout, not so much for energy usage during the training itself. Right. Uh, some people have certainly experimented with phosphates, with uh, sodium bicarbonate, and taking that stuff and ingesting it to remove or reduce uh, the acidosis. It can work, but also creates a lot of gastric distress. So you got to really be careful of playing with that kind of stuff. Anything you do want to do to see if you can improve performance has to be done for a long enough time to be sure it's going to work, let alone you doing the research to make sure it's going to work. And as long as it's safe, and it's legal, <laughs> and you think you can find a balance there where actually you can help your athlete out, something worth considering after, of course, you have the proper programming, and then the proper diet, because you're not the dietitian, you're the, you're the coach. First thing is the program, then you talk about the diet, what's going on the rest of your life, what's the stress going on, then maybe we talk about supplementation, things that might help as well. Uh, now, we did mention before, blood flow, uh, or at least blood flow in general, when it's cold out, you're going to have issues with blood flow quite, right? It's going to be much more difficult to get the proper blood flow because you're cold. Whereas warm, it's going to be easier. Some people say it goes so far as say you shouldn't stretch in cold environments. That's just not true. It's going to be easier to stretch in, in warm environments, but you can totally stretch when you're cold. Absolutely. That said, it'll be certainly easier to get greater elongation of the tissues if it's warmer. So it's a better idea if you have the opportunity to do it. But that said, when it's really cold out, the reason why your skin gets cold is blood rushes inwardly to keep the organs safe and warm. So oftentimes you get cold hands, cold feet. Don't assume if someone has cold hands or cold feet, they're actually technically cold. Skin is cold, but they might be plenty warm. Okay. In fact, you often find some of the most well-conditioned athletes who are endurance-type athletes, glycolytic type athletes, will actually be the hottest ones in the room when it's fairly hot because they, they quickly body adapts very quickly. Sweat. They're the ones sweating the most. Okay. As well as in cold environments, they don't get cold easily. They're the ones that their hands are cold, their feet are cold, but they feel, they feel fine, okay? And some of that's genetic as well, of course, your blood flow and how your body responds to stress. Some of that is genetic and do nothing about it. But conditioning-wise, ideally, you want to have the person be able to cope with both forms of environment, got to acclimate properly, right? Your warm-up certainly need to be shorter for the hot environments, a little longer for the cold environments, 20 minutes plus for really cold, five minutes-ish when it's really hot. Explosive workout, five minutes-ish. Uh, Endurance-type workouts, you might be seeing closer to the 20-plus minute type uh, warm-up type period, okay? Uh, but that said, either extreme is going to create acidosis. So we've got to make sure we're coping properly with our athletes. Uh, water intake, I've been saying it before, every 15, 20 minutes, going to take at least five to 10 ounces of water, ideally. You'll see some variations in this, but that's a fairly good number. Certainly, if you're going to the bathroom every two hours, yeah, that's probably a good place to be. If you're going to the bathroom a couple times during your practice session, you're definitely overhydrated or somehow you're losing water and that's not from a standpoint of what you're taking in maybe too fast, okay, which we don't want to do. Taking too much in too quickly. You don't need to take a gallon jug of water to the gym. That's ridiculous, the stuff we see people do with that kind of thing. Uh, that said, when the goal is weight loss, we probably don't want to see much more than 250 to 500 mil, uh, calorie difference per day with people with the diet. Uh, whatever they lose, in their uh, workout, two pounds of water lost during the workout training session. Make sure they take in one and a half to double that, three to four pounds of water, essentially 48 to 64 ounces of water over the next few hours 
post training session. Okay, and with coping with extremes, uh, certainly it's hot and cold out, extreme hot, extreme cold. You got to be drinking in more water as well. You may need to cope with that a little bit more. Drink even more than that. Ten ounces probably should be enough every fifteen minutes for just about anybody. That's on the high end. Okay, uh, but that said, that's uh, or actually I should say every ten minutes will be on the high end for ten ounces for some extreme certain circumstances, which would be at the most sixty ounces uh, in an hour. Right? That's at the most. Okay. Uh, final thoughts, things to think about now, going into our final few weeks. Uh, no one's really doing going too far with like with going with saying that so-and-so told me or so-and-so says, uh, but you can tell it in some of the way you write, and we'd all do this. We tend to latch on to certain ideas, probably because someone we really respected came up with the idea. It doesn't mean you're doing any disservice to the person who taught you something if you go against what they said. Right? It includes me, includes anybody else you ever learned from. We want to make sure we're building upon what we've done in the past. It doesn't negate what you did in the past. It doesn't negate how good a coach you are if you change the things you've been doing, if you entertain new possibilities based on new knowledge gained, new applications gained from that knowledge. We want to make sure you're always growing with that. So make sure you're not just holding on to the same concepts. You should be talking differently in your discussion board, discussion board posts six weeks later now than maybe you were a few weeks ago because of that knowledge gained. That is the goal, right? Uh, and that said, actually, most of you are doing a good job with this. You're now getting your citation cons consistency down with your APA format. Certainly, your papers just turned in here too. Hopefully, we're seeing a lot more of that as well. Well, well cited. Uh, make sure you're attaching that document in PDF form or cl making it a hyperlink clickable so everybody can access your article. You lose points every week if you don't do that. You, just, you have to do it. You couldn't get published. Uh, a researcher could not get published if they didn't properly cite it. Right, you got to make sure you're showing at least who you're who you're getting information from, or at least some of the primary concepts you're getting them from, and that you're taking the effort to go learn more about it. That's the whole purpose for doing it. Not trying to make it tedious, not trying to make it hard on you. We simply want to make sure you're making some effort to go to another source you haven't looked at before for some interesting ideas to be posing uh, into the discussion to talk about what things might be the case. Right, and no study is completely flawless, so there's always variations, always possibilities from it. But it certainly leads us to think a little more clearly about ways we might adapt our training or uh, change what we do to make it more efficient and more effective and safe for our athletes. Right, and of course, that said, we are now into our sixth week, and we are basically over halfway through. Uh, wish you the best, and hope the holidays are treating you very, very well. Keep at it. Keep emailing me if you have questions. Let me know how I can help you out. And look forward to being with you these last few weeks.